Alright, so I had the great Bernardo Castro up on my channel and interviewed him and I thought the conversation was phenomenal. But if you are a materialist listening to this and you still think that you can hold on to your, to your materialism, you can't. It's over, guys. Now, I was a little bit surprised Bernardo Castro, um, he seems to have moved more He's become more of an idealist than I remembered him from the books and from the stuff I've listened to. Um, he's practically gone full Vedanta Hindu. Um, there's an ontic idealist, which is what he is, and then I would call myself an epistemic idealist, which means I don't necessarily think idealism is true. I think it is the right interpretive framework for probably the next hundred years. It's, and it's the... the it is, the, I, it is the philosophy that is to come. As I've said in the past, if the choice is binary, materialists listen up. If the choice is binary between materialism and idealism, idealism wins hands down. But I'm talking about epistemic idealism, just an interpretive framework, just a philosophical, just a, as a means of investigation. But idealism wins hands down. And guess what? As of right now, the choice is binary. Materialism fails. I, I know you don't want to hear that materialist. It fails. Why? It's insufficient to explain the data. Now, one of the last videos I tried to point out a really simple way to underscore this. I talked about my yellow boogie board. Um, now, deconverted man being, being the deconverted man, you know, debunked my analogy. The problem was is that the analogy was just trying to underscore the obvious. So what he said, what I said is that with the boogie board in front of me, um... I, can, I, I, I cannot know through materialism what color it is. He said that you can actually do a thorough enough investigation of a boogie board and you can figure out what color it's going to present itself as. Okay, fair enough. But it's not really the point. The point is if you were explaining to a blind man, okay, the boogie board happens to be yellow, the difference between yellow and red, there's nothing that you could do to explain that difference to a blind man. Why? It requires an experience... Say, well, the yellow is just kind of like, uh, you know, it's more yellowish than red. Well, what does that mean? Well, red is, you know, kind of like red-like qualities. There's nothing you could do to explain it to a blind man. Why? It requires an ex visual experience of color in consciousness in order for you to even understand what a color is. So, if, if he's going to quibble with, with that particular analogy, let's move to our desk in front of me. The desk in front of me, okay? And d d there's no way around this, guys. There are two, pro two, thing two sets of properties to the desk in front of me. The primary properties, which are intrinsic to the desk in front of me, and the secondary properties. The secondary properties materialism cannot tell us anything about. So, for example, if you do not like the color analogy, I am looking at the desk right now, and it is being presented back to me, I am re-representing it back to myself as solid matter. That's a fact. The desk is in solid matter. That's also a fact. The only way I could ever account for, I can even know that that discrepancy exists, is through idealism, an experience of the desk in consciousness. Other than that, materialism couldn't tell me anything about that. There are, there are numerous ways where materialism itself is insufficient to explain the data. If you are uncomfortable with me using the terms materialism and idealism, you want me to be more precise? There's an object-based ontology to the desk. That is the bread and butter of scientific investigation. Why? The object-based ontology are the properties that are intrinsic to the desk itself. They're actually there. Now, why the materialists are having such a hard time letting go of it? Not only is it comforting for them, it's because there's an objectively verifiable truth to the desk, Okay, it's also the bread and butter of science. Why? Because the, the intrinsic properties of the, the desk, the object-based ontology is, I can, for example, I can tell you that it's made of wood. I can heat up the wood, and I can tell you what degree the wood burns. I can write that down on a piece of paper, and someone independent of me can come and verify that the next day. So object-based ontology produces the trust, and it is, it is heavily related to empiricism, why a person can come along tomorrow, 
look at what I wrote about what what the what what how the wood heats. Try it out and go, yeah, he's right, the wood heats, check, sign off on it. So there are material facts about the desk that are objectively verifiable. That's not what materialism is insufficient for. There are also, and this is a fact, guys, there's no way around this. If you are a materialist, you, you, you can either start agreeing with me now or you can agree with me three years from now. It doesn't matter to me what you choose. Why? Because I'm about to tell you a fact. A fact. There are also a context-based ontology to the desk in front of me. A context-based ontology. The reason why I jumped up to quantum mechanics, why? Because quantum mechanics proves this. There are a bunch of things about that desk that I cannot tell you just according to its intrinsic properties. Why? Because there are things about, there are facts of the matter involving that desk that are only known through its context. For example, where it is. Where is that desk, Craig? I don't know. It's right in front of your face, Craig. That's where it is in relation to me, contextually. But where it is, there's a, there's a whole series of stuff that we, we meaning we, the world at large, the scientific community, people in general, don't understand about locality at all. And if you are a materialist, you can agree with me now, you can agree with me three years from now, I don't care. You are eventually going to realize that you're going to have to give it up. Why? Because I'm telling the God's honest truth. There are primary properties of that desk and there are secondary properties of the desk. And materialism can't tell us anything about the secondary properties. And it can't tell us anything about the context of the desk. And that's a really important part of the story of the desk. Materialism fails. Insufficient to explain the data. All The reason why I jumped to quantum mechanics, why quantum mechanics proves this. The mathematics of quantum mechanics is precise, and there's no getting around this. The Schrodinger wave, okay, at the quantum level, prior to measurement, anything about the, uh, the real material world is a wave of probability. A probability hasn't occurred yet. So I can't tell you the full story of the location of the electron or the photon prior to measurement. Why? Because it hasn't happened yet. So to some degree, it isn't actually there. That's the part of quantum mechanics that troubled them right from the start. So if you're a materialist, you only have two options, guys. I'm assuming that you understand that quantum mechanics is, true, is the truth, that the physics work, that the very cell phone that you have in your hand right now has been powered by quantum mechanics. Okay, so you know that the science works. You know that the science works and you know that the mathematics is precise. Both of those things you understand of as facts. Okay, you only got two possible options. Many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics or Bohmian mechanics pilot wave. Those are the only two interpretations of quantum mechanics that keep materialism alive. Both of them are false. Both of them are case studies in motivated reasoning. Why? Because they bend over backwards to eliminate the obvious, which is the probabilistic nature of quantum mechanics. Prior to measurement, the, the quote-unquote particle, we, don't, we can't say where it is yet. We can say where it probably will occur. Okay, that means it isn't actually there. That's what that clearly means or clearly implies. And the reason why that troubles scientists so much is that they've been steeped in materialism. Isn't all that complex, isn't all that hard to wrap your brain around. It just requires you to think about the real material world in a way different than you had been trained to think about it. I swear to God, that's all it means. That's why Carlo Rovelli, to his great credit, started trying to study Buddhism as a physicist. Why? Because he wants, he realized that materialism, the way scientists are trained to think about the world, was impeding his progress with understanding quantum mechanics. He had to train his brain to think a different way about the relationship in the, the relationships in the quote unquote real world. That's why I posted the Sean Carroll link, where Sean Carroll says, I'm a scientist, ultimately I'm a realist. And Carlo Rovelli goes kind of chuckle, chuckle, chuckle. So am I, within reason, dude. <laughs> so if you're a materialist, those are your only two options, dude. I promise. Deconverted, man, those are your only two options. You're, you're super excited about science, right? You're Mr. Science, okay? You only got two options in quantum mechanics. There aren't 15,000 different interpretations of quantum mechanics. There are roughly 10. 
And there are only two that keep materialism alive. Why? Because they eliminate the probabilistic nature of the outcome. Bohemian mechanics, pilot wave, and many worlds. Those are the only two that keep materialism alive. Other than that, there's an important story about the real material world that can only be figured out in context, in relationship to other properties. There is a story about the desk in front of me that can only be known in context. So there is an object based ontology to the desk in front of me. That seems to be the part where I disagree with, with uh, Bernardo Castro to some degree. He seems to have moved into pure idealism. And that's what he talks about when he says the, the desk, he'll say the desk represents itself on the screen of consciousness. Okay, that's true. And there are some things about the desk that can only be known about it through its representation on the screen of consciousness. He seems to think, once you understand that the desk has primary properties and secondary properties, the question obviously becomes, is there anything other than secondary properties? <laughs> it's a real question, actually. Is there a desk there at all? <laughs> That's a real question. That's a real question. Is there actually a desk there at all when I am not looking at it? And he's starting to lean towards, no, not really. Now, I don't. I think there is an object-based ontology to the desk. That exists independent of observation and independent of interactions with other, with other properties, including conscious agents. But I also know for a fact I know for a fact, did you hear that? Materialism is over. Why? Because I know for a fact there are also aspects of that ontology that are context-based. And that eliminates materialism altogether. And that's been totally proven by quantum mechanics, guys. End of discussion. You can agree with me now, or you can agree with me three years from now. Choice is yours. I'm telling you the God's honest truth, there's no way around this. Materialism over. The scientific community will wake up to this fact. Why? Because it's a fact. It's over. There are things about that desk that cannot be known by its intrinsic properties alone. There are things about that desk that cannot be known by its object-based ontology. There is some object-based ontology to it, but it's nowhere near as much of a, of a case closed. That's an object that exists independent of, of interactions and observations and scientists had previously understood, it to, previously understood it to be. That's all that I'm saying. Yes, there is an object-based ontology to it to some degree, but there is an important part of that object that has a context-based ontology that's at least 30% of it that, 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 that scientists had previously wanted to acknowledge or understand. That acknowledgement or that understanding is coming case closed. Idealism is the only thing that accounts for both. Why? Because I can have an experience of the object in consciousness, and then I can also, in consciousness, disassemble its material properties and heat it up and do all that stuff in consciousness. That's why I'm an epistemic idealist. It is the only thing that accounts for both the object-based ontology and the context-based ontology. Materialism only tells the story of one, the object-based ontology. Well, that's not enough. I'm telling you the God's honest truth, guys, there's no way around this. You can, you, if you do not agree with me, you didn't clearly understand what I said. Play the video back. You don't clearly understand. There's nothing to debate. There's nothing to debate. Sean Carroll will eventually yield. Why? Because the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is false. He'll eventually wake up to that fact he's not as much of an ideologue as the other physicalist slash materialist. That's my guess. Once he yields, game over. Game over. Carlo Rovelli is a physicist, and he's the first person to tell you that he was raised as a materialist, and he wants to stay a materialist. But he can't. Why? Because the physics don't lie. There is something about that desk in front of me. How much we don't know yet, there is some, some anti-realism involved in the story. There is something about that desk that only exists contextually. Only exists contextually. Only can be known contextually. In context, with other sets of properties. That's a fact, guys. There's no getting around it. Idealism is the only possible interpretive framework that can account for that fact. Materialism is insufficient to explain it. Materialism's over. You can agree with me now, or you can agree with me three years from now. It doesn't make any difference to me. Eventually, you're going to know that I'm telling you the God's honest truth. Now, the question becomes...
first of all, I was surprised at how easily um, Bernardo Castro was, was, was willing to sign on when I said, you know, I'm a Christian, and I think that you're, you're starting to influence a lot of Christians. Idealism is becoming... There are a couple of Christians now who are idealists. It looks like Christian idealism is an idealist. Yeah, yeah it looks like it. Um, looks like invoking deism becoming one, and IP is one. And I'm one, but I'm an epistemic idealist, which is different. I just think of it as a philosophy. I don't think of it as an, as a, as an ontic reality, which Bernardo Castro does. I think there are facts of the matter, objectively speaking, about that desk, and then there are facts of the matter, objectively speaking, about that desk, that can only be inferred through consciousness or its interaction with other properties. And I'm positive that's a fact. So materialism fails. And idealism so far is the only other philosophy in town that can tell us anything at all about the world we live in. So it is the philosophy to come. And as a, when Bernardo Castro was so ready to sign on to, like I said, that you're going to be influential in Christianity, he was excited. I couldn't believe that. It's like, yeah, I'd love to be like, you know, someone who, who instigated a, a, a Christian revival, he even said, a religious revival in the West. I'd love to be responsible for that. I was really, really surprised that he said that to that degree. But to some degree, it's going to be what happens. Why? Because just as materialism sort of automatically produces atheism, materialism states basically in the beginning stuff. And out of this, some configurations of stuff arises human beings and ultimately arises consciousness. Okay, that's the story of materialism. Materialism is insufficient to explain how that stuff interacts with other stuff, including consciousness. That, that philosophy, materialism, together with scientism, is the reigning dogma of the scientific community is materialism. Almost huge chunk of the atheist community are materialists. Reductive materialists and scientism is. Once, once the scientism is a false position, but so is reductive materialism. As I've just explained, it's insufficient to explain the data. There is an experience of the desk in consciousness that materialism doesn't account for at all. Can't tell me anything about. So idealism is the next philosophy to come. And as, as I predicted, it will be become the reigning dogma of the scientific community. That's my guess. Once, once people start waking up to the fact that it's, idealism has enormous explanatory power too, it just hasn't been explored yet. And part of that explanatory power is going to be the discrepancies that I've already talked about. One of the things that Bernardo Castro is 100% correct about, and so is Donald Hoffman. I prefer the Donald Hoffman explanations better. When you are not, when you look out the window, people have thought historically... And materialism and science is still trapped in this, this way of thinking. It's trapped in a way of thinking that is long since past its, its time in history. That we are looking out of a window at the real world. We aren't. Our conscious, our, our brains are reinterpreting reality back to us in ways totally different than what is actually out there. That's a really important fact. And that's, that fact alone is going to have enormous explanatory power for idealism, for the science moving forward. Why? Because that's a fact. As Donald Hoffman says it, it's like we're wearing virtual reality headsets. And he's even demonstrated this so that this is not arguable. He's shown in a video. He puts dots on a wall. You see the dots as 3D. They aren't 3D. Okay, that's happening a lot just in front of your face. There are particles floating around in front of your face right now that are invisible. Okay? They're there. They have material substance, so technically they could be visible. But your brain is filtering out that information. Why? It's not useful to you. It would be really confusing for you to see it. There are sounds in the atmosphere right now that you can't hear. That's what a dog whistle is. Dogs can hear frequencies that humans can't. So there are sounds going off in the atmosphere right around you that aren't available to your senses, even though those sounds are actually there. And there are, there are things going, there are th particles floating around in front of your face that you can't see. Those are important facts. Those are important facts. And those facts are going to lend an enormous amount of explanatory power to idealism. Why? Because those are facts and those are really important. The discrepancies between the, the, what, what, what Kant referred to as the phenomenon-noumena distinction between the world as it actually occurs 
and between how we perceive it, there's manifold thousands of these discrepancies. And these are really important facts moving forward. Why? Because they're facts. So Bernardo Castro was 100% right about that. Where I think he goes too far, and I think Donald Hoffman goes too far, is now that they become idealists, they started to, you know, lean too heavily into the unreality of what is in front of our face. I don't think our consciousness affects the world. I don't think I can dream any and affect anything. I don't think my perceiving necessarily affects it either. I do think there is some objective reality, standalone ontology to the world, just nowhere near as much as scientists had previously thought. And I think that's a fact, and that's a really obvious fact. And that fact means materialism's over. And that's going to affect people, spiritual, people spiritually speaking. Materialism sort of went hand in glove. Hand in, materialism goes hand in glove with atheism. It naturally produces atheism. If you think that this is just a world of stuff, you know, the, the idealism goes hand in glove. That's why I was surprised that he was so, so readily available to, to the idea that what he calls mind at large and, and God, tomato, tomato. But it makes sense to me. Why? Because it, it naturally fits with theism. It's not that much. If you, if you sign on to his metaphysics, now the reason why I don't preach his metaphysics is because he hasn't proved it. He seems to think that there is a unified field of consciousness, what he calls mind at large, and that we are just dis disassociated consciousness within this sort of omni-consciousness. And that consciousness itself is not only ontological primitive, but that consciousness itself is basically, you know, we're, we are, as he's explained the analogy, it's like, a, it's like a, a water and we are whirlpools within water. So a whirlpool has a separate, has a separate entity within water, but ontologically speaking, it's entirely identical. A whirlpool is just comprised of water. That's how he thinks of the mind at large, that there's consciousness at large and we are disintended, disassociated con consciousnesses within consciousness at large. And over the, over the course of, you know, the sense I've been listening to him, he seems to have gone more in the direction of a type of Hinduism that the real material world is almost entirely just something that presents itself on the screen of perception and thus almost completely illusory. Now, I'm not completely with him on that. But if he is right about mind at large and there is some empirical evidence to suggest that he is correct, some, not enough for me to say he's 100% correct. But if he's right, that naturally fits with, you know, mind at large, God, tomato, tomato. Mind at large, God, tomato, tomato, offers a lot of explanatory power as to why religion is so prominent, why religions are so, and also why religions are so contradictory in nature, as atheists love to point out. Why? Because you aren't completely connected to mind at large. There's only things that you can infer about mind at large, or if you prefer, that you can experience about mind at large through, for example, prayer or ritual. Mind at large is not something that you entirely understand. You are a disintended consciousness within a universal consciousness. I'm just talking his postulate. I'm not saying I agree with it. He's got some empirical evidence for his postulate. For example, one that I thought was very compelling that we didn't get into as much as I wanted to was that when you take hallucinogens, the natural inclination is it's making you trip out the natural thought process this is how a materialist would automatically think of it, is that they're revving up your brain to some degree, that's why you're having all these vivid, weird experiences. Okay, what they're in fact doing is slowing your brain down. What they're in fact doing is slowing your brain down. There's another thing that he talks about where kids play this game where they do this like hyperventilation game so they, they black out, and it's the same idea, they trip out. All religious experiences have these transcendent element to it. These overlapping, you know, time distortion is... If you go look at the things I've been talking about from day one, okay, there's a diagnostic criteria to almost everything that counts as a spiritual experience. And there are eight key ones. Ineffability of that experience. Time distortion. The sense of timelessness or you're outside of time tends to be a key one. And these are trans... These are occur across... All religions and all cultures, these are transcultural. These are transcendent experiences. They happen the same way. That's why there's a diagnostic criteria for them. 
Okay? So when kids black out and they play this, uh, this let me black out game, they tend to have a hallucinatory quality similar to the psychedelics. Implying, not quite proving, but clearly implying that your brain is actually filtering out information that could be available to your consciousness that, that is, your brain is actually filtering it out. So when you take a hallucinogen, you aren't actually revving up your brain, experiencing things that aren't there. You are just having, uh, your brain is actually slowing down its filters. So more of this omniconsciousness is coming in. If you've ever done hallucination, any type of hallucinogens, not only does that explanation make complete sense, it's exactly what you experience it as. Tripping was so interesting because it wasn't all that trippy. You felt like you were just getting a different perspective on reality. Talk to anybody who's done hallucinogens, particularly mushrooms. They'll tell you the same thing that I experienced firsthand. Doesn't feel like you're, you, you do do some hallucinating, but it feels like you are just more vividly experiencing some things than you normally do. Like I remember walking home and it looked like the, the, the pavement that nature was breaking through the pavement. Now that's actually what was happening. The, the, the pavement was being distorted where the roots of the trees were starting to grow back. But you could experience it a lot more vividly. It's hard to explain exactly what I mean. There was a lot of things that happened to me like that. Things that would probably be available to your conscious, your conscious mind. That was the first time I ever felt like I had a spiritual experience. Okay, that was long before I became a Christian, was when I started doing hallucinogens. A lot of people will tell you they have things that they consider spiritual when they do hallucinogens. Okay? You start some of the things that happen to you when you are on them, feel like you are just more vividly experiencing things that you could be experiencing all the time. That's a huge part of what that feeling is. So it made complete sense to me that that's what it is in fact going on. Just for example, the most famous one is when the Beatles took their high-grade LSD. Uh, one thing that got reported a lot back then was that people could see music. Now, music is sound vibrations in the air. It could easily be available to you visually. There's probably just no use for you to see music. But that was a key thing. People would say, like, you know, they could see music. So you put on the, like, you know, picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. Somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly. The girl with kaleidoscope eyes. Cellophane flowers of yellow and green Towering over your head Look for the girl with the sun in her eyes And she's gone Lucy in this... I mean, that song is famously supposedly about LSD Did you know that? Most of you probably know that, right? Lucy Sky Diamonds, LSD That's what historically What everybody has taken this song to be about An analogy about tripping I mean, if you listen to the song, it seems to be exactly what it's about, so I've always believed that. Could be uh, just an apocrypha. I think it's probably true. <laughs> Lucy Sky Diamonds, LSD. But famously, when people took that high-level LSD, they were able to see music. Now, music is sound vibrations in the air. We can see some vibrations in the air. So it makes sense to me that there is a unified field of consciousness and that we are disintended consciousness within it. It's possible. But if he can prove that and gather more empirical evidence for that, if that's not quite God of the, the cosmos, like, you know, the um, um, omnibenevolent, omnipotent sky God who's going to, you know, punish you if you touch a wiener, if it's not quite that God, that's at least really obviously explains why people are so committed to the idea of God. Why? Because there's some form of omniconsciousness that we are all able to somewhat participate in. Not only does that make sense, that makes a lot of sense of religion, actually, that there's, there's some sort of omni-consciousness thingy that we all can experience a little bit, and why, it's all, why, why religions are so cacophonous is that we don't experience it very clearly. Even in the Bible itself, even in pure Christianity, it says, now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. So that's even part of the Christian canon of, of straight Christianity. 
what, that we don't fully get it. We can't fully wrap our brains around it. We can't fully experience, have a real spiritual experience of God. But anyway, so I'm rambling a little. The point is, the most important conversation going on in this space right now, and I only see this gaining strength, this conversation between idealism and materialism hasn't fully arrived in the space yet. It's three years off, at least. But at least three years, maybe, maybe a little less, maybe more, but I'd say roughly three years off. Once this, once this conversation starts happening in full, most of the stuff being talked about out there right now, atheist Christian land is totally and completely and utterly irrelevant. Almost all of it is irrelevant. This is extraordinarily important. This is extraordinarily important. So I like the fact that he said he'd be totally down with being responsible for a religious revival. I'm not quite saying that this is a religious revival in the making, but idealism naturally lends itself to theism, naturally. They dovetail easily together. I was surprised with how comfortable he was with the idea of talking about mind at large as God and being the exact same thing. Now, what I wasn't surprised about was how, you know, that's how normal intellectual people used to talk about God and religion prior to the head trip that atheism has done on the space. The four horsemen are mostly responsible for the wildly, like, rabidly anti-theistic tone to atheists today. Prior to the four horsemen, you could be an atheist and not, like, rabidly, oh my God, God, you talk about God. <laughs> that was not a normal response by a rational actor. And nor is it today. That's the really weird part about atheism proper. Why, between me and Aaron Ra, he is far less rational than I am. Get him talking about religion, he foams at the mouth about it. He's not even close to what you would call a rational actor. Not even close. So the idea that that's a more rational take on religion is totally just outlandish. It's not even close. Most of what, what goes on here is anti-Christian propaganda that's been amplified up to like 11, or more like 17 on a scale of 1 to 10, and it's near constant. So you say things like God, and people go, ah, bleh. People aren't like that back in the real world, guys. If you're an atheist, listen, I promise. Even the nons. You know how atheists get all excited that everyone's deconstructing and becoming nons? Go talk to nons. They're not atheists. They're not. They're really comfortable talking about God as just an omnipresent type thing. They really are. And these are people who don't go to church. And if you say, do you believe in God, they say no. But then you start talking to them and they're really comfortable talking about God as if God is omnipresent in life. I swear to God that's true. I swear to God that's true. See? I swear to God that's true. I went back to New York. And New York, New York. The places where I came from, the place where I live now, too, is secular land. Well, California is not as much, interestingly enough. It's just as much a blue state as New York, but it's way less secular. New York is totally secular. Secular. I grew up in basically Holland or, you know, one of those, one of the places that atheists always point to as the future, and it's so awesome. I basically grew up there, you know. And the people back there who are nons, don't get all tripped out about God and religion, and they, they don't automatically recoil in horror at even the conversation. They're pretty comfortable with even talking about God. I was surprised at how comfortable Bernardo Castro was talking about spirituality and the transcendent God. I was, I was surprised. I thought it was pretty cool. But that's how most normal people used to be back in the day. Back when I was growing up, I didn't know many believers at all. But when you had conversations about religion, that's how most people responded. Yeah, be cool. You know, church is kind of interesting. Or you should believe in a higher power. They recognized the value of it, even though they didn't participate in it. They recognized the value of it immediately. And they thought it was like, you know, it's like my sister. When she first had her, her kids, this before she became a Christian. She's a Christian now because she saw the change in me and struck, well, I guess she's a Christian now. She was Christian for a little bit when she first came out to California. Her and her husband became Christians on the spot. Why? Because they saw the change in me and they saw how stark it was. So they went, went back home and they became Christians. Um, she's still sort of a Christian now, I guess. I, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't really ask. But prior to her being a Christian at all, when she would have described herself as an agnostic or disinterested in religion, she wasn't going to church, she had thought, you know, I, I think she started poking around for a religion to raise her child up in. Because that's how most rational people thought about religion, as something positive, something like, 
well, I want him to have some sort of sense of eternal values or, or, or you know, transcendence or some sort of sense of there's a spiritual portion of life. So she started poking around. She was looking into Judaism, Quakerism, going, you know, I kind of want to have a place to take my kid. I don't want him to be completely secular. That used to be a normal, healthy, of uh, what I mean, my sister sort of what you would call the intelligentsia, okay? She, you know, double major from University of Pennsylvania, grad school at Columbia. So she's sort of what you would consider the intelligentsia. That's how the intelligentsia used to be about religion prior to the propaganda wheels of, of, of the four horsemen and the people who came in their wake. They used to actually like have an, a kind of an automatic pro-religious stance. Religion is somewhat positive. They saw the benefits of intrinsic of spirituality. They were not fans of organized religion. You know, she'd be the first person to complain about the Catholic Church or whatever. Based on politics, actually, she's pretty, she's pretty left. Totally left, actually. She's a wokester now. You're a wokester. Shut up, man. <laughs> she's a wokester. That's just annoying. Um, she's totally left. Um, anyways, I'm rambling a little. But there's a point here. And the point is that this this knee-jerk sort of I hate religion thing, that's propaganda. That's propaganda from atheist land. That isn't an automatic thing. That's something you've trained yourself to do. That's why some of the people in the, in the, in the you know, were freaking out at, at Bernardo Castro. His postulate isn't proven, okay? It is an extra thing. That's why I'm much more comfortable with the, with the Donald Hoffman version of idealism. The Donald Hoffman version simply says consciousness is, consciousness is the ontological primitive. Consciousness is the ontological primitive. I don't see any way of avoiding that as the only conclusion you could come to, scientifically speaking, philosophically speaking, for the next hundred years. Why? Because it, it's, the materialism is insufficient to explain the data as I explained in the first part of the video. I don't see any arguing with me. You can take issue with me now. Three years from now, you're going to be agreeing with me. Why? I'm telling you the God's honest truth. But the other part of the story is that sort of knee-jerk, I hate religion thing. That's propaganda from atheist land. That's not how normal, intelligent people thought of religion prior to, you know, 2003 or so. It's not. It's not even close. It's not. It's really not. And I get it, why, why if you were raised like a fundamentalist, you'd think that that's automatically what religion is to people, but it's not. Back when I was growing up, that's not how we thought of Christianity. I mean, I wasn't very interested in Christianity growing up, to tell you the truth, didn't know much about it. But I didn't think of it as automatically, all oh, these guys are all these, you know, rabid fundamentalists who are going to come like... I didn't think of it that way at all. And I grew up in a town where that type of thinking would have been absolutely primary. Grew up in about as secular left wing of a town as it possible to grow up in this side of Berkeley, California. So, just some observations. I guess I will leave it at that. Get ready, get ready, get ready, kids. Why? Because idealism is coming. Again, I, I am more of an epistemic idealist. I think of it as a philosophy. It is the philosophy to come. The conversation between idealism and materialism is a hundred times more important to atheist Christianity than anything being discussed out there right now as we speak. But idealism hasn't fully hit in the Christian community yet. I say it's three years out. Then a lot of people will be signing on to idealism. Once that starts to happen, you know, you remember you heard it here first. Just remember you heard it here first. The conversation between the idealist and the materialist is a hundred times more important than anything being discussed out there right now in atheist Christian land. Anything. And there's only one way I see it ending, in favor of the idealist. Period. End of discussion. What type of idealist? That's the only thing that needs to be discussed. How much of a real world is there actually? I think a lot more than Bernardo Castro does. I'm, I'm about like only 80% of where he is or 75% of where he is. But idealism is coming. I'm almost positive of that. Why? I don't see any other way around it. There's no other, there's no other ism on the table. You know, it's like with capitalism, communism. You only got two choices, basically. Socialism, capitalism, communism. You only got a handful of choices. Well, right now, you only got two. Materialism, idealism. And if the choice is binary, idealism wins hands down. End of discussion. So, there you have it, kids. That's all for now. The mass has ended. Go in peace. Amen.